Hello. Oh, no, I'm not muted. Hello, good morning. Good morning. I might have it automatically, everybody muted when they come to the room to start off with. Okay. This is my first time hosting a Zoom meeting, so bear with me. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, it's not my first time. So really? Okay, it's good. All, it's all good. <clears throat> we will figure it out. And um, so you're the host, correct? So yes. you're, you're going to, okay. Is it waiting room? Are you, we going to have to let folks in? No, it shouldn't. It should just automatically okay. let everybody oh, okay. in. Great. I wasn't quite sure how to do the waiting room and um, I have the entire thing recording. So it's recording right now. Okay. Cause I think um, Ruth was saying that she wanted to record it so she could share it with anybody at a future date. And I told her I would yeah. also email her the PowerPoint because there's a lot of good like useful information on there. Oh, I, I bet there's going to be a ton of useful. <laughs> there's um, like phone numbers and email addresses and stuff too. So perfect. 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 Let's see, okay. So we still have a few minutes. Yeah. Well, good. And I'll, um, you know, I'll introduce you, of course. And if you need me to monitor, um, the chat or anything for questions and so on. That would be great um, because yeah. I, I'm going to go through the PowerPoint. There might be a point during the PowerPoint where I might pause, but I might also wait till the end to do some demonstrations. Um, I'm going to talk about some inhalers and proper use of inhalers. And so I have like, I have little fake devices that I can oh, actually show how to properly use inhalers. Um, that's the only thing that I think I really need to stop and like do, but I might kind of wait and save that for the end. Yeah, however you want to do it. <clears throat> Good morning. <laughs> this is Suhei. Morning, Suhei. This is my director of the respiratory department at Tallahassee Memorial. Hi. Hello. Nice to meet <laughs> you. I'm Melanie. Nice to meet you. I'm sitting in for Ruth. I'm the okay. upside program coordinator, and Ruth, of course, is our health and wellness. Uh, program yes. coordinator, but she couldn't be in two places at one time. So. Yeah, she's right. double booked by accident. <laughs> yeah. Which is fine. Yeah, she keeps way too many calendars. I could not ever <laughs> do that. I need one calendar. Well, I had originally <laughs> reached out to her, I want to say like October to try and get in by November for because you know, November is COPD Awareness Month. And she was like, yeah, we're booked until spring. <laughs> Even with COVID going on, so I, was I know, like, isn't that? I'll yeah. Take it. yeah, we've managed to keep rocking and rolling with uh, with mostly with Zoom. I mean, that's awesome, though. I mean, at least as as long as you can get stuff out there and continue trucking along. Mm -hmm. Got somebody. Yeah, we got a while. We still got like 11 minutes. Yeah. So this thing, the Zoom meeting says 40 minutes on this. Um, oh, okay. So you have, this, okay. This so if you have the free Zoom account, mm -hmm. it will shut this meeting down then. At the oh, end of, no. How do I fix that? By paying them money. Oh, um, no. And you're making, me the host is not going to help, I think, with that. If it's your account, mm -hmm. um, darn it! Wish we would have known that because we could have been the ones to be to to host it using our account. That's why I was kind um, of waiting to start it. I'll try and go through quickly because um, okay. I didn't even notice that until right now. I'm looking at it, it says Zoom meeting forty minutes, and I was like, wait a minute, what does that mean? <laughs> oh, right. So it's going to be mm, so it might be forty minutes from when we started. Oh no! Hold on. Let me see if I can real quick navigate away from this <clears throat> and then maybe you can just focus on the you know the big points and demonstrations yeah. um i do know that with the free zoom the more people that join it they start giving you longer um oh. longer oh. time because i was I, I started using zoom for interviews and it would start me at 30 minutes and after i did one or two 
and I had more participants, um, it, it extended it to 45 minutes to an hour. It's like they give you little deals. Oh. Now you can have a whole hour. <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully that'll be, hopefully that'll be the case. Um, yeah, I know that in the beginning, what they would do is if there were only two people in a meeting and you had just the free account, you could, you know, you could meet indefinitely because they were thinking about telehealth and doctors and counselors and all of that. I don't know if they're still doing that, but of course we will have more than two people. So that's not going to be relevant. I don't know if I even upgrade right now, if it'll make a... That's a great question. If it'll make a difference for what we're doing right now. I'm so surprised TMH didn't. I mean, we went ahead and bought bought stuff and we have several administrators and we're just a little senior center. Well, this is kind of something that I really kind of did on my own and, you know, kind of... Um, I'm actually at home right now. I've been working back at bedside for the past few months. I won't even start back into my position uh, as the chronic lung disease navigator until next week. Um, so I've been working nights and trying to put this together wow. and, and all that. So this is kind of something that I kind of put together on my own outside of what I've been working on already. Okay. All right, well, we will, we will do our best to make it, to make it work. Yeah, we can. I mean, I will really go over the most important aspects and hopefully this is something we can do again. Like mm -hmm. I, I really would like to continue, you know, it's ever continuing. There's always changes in medications. There's always changes in information. Like there's a new inhaler that just came on the market. That's fantastic. Um, and I also, this one's really going to focus on COPD, but I do have a lot of information about asthma and adults with asthma. Um, the hospital works closely with the Florida Asthma Coalition. Um, I'm part of the Asthma and Allergy Network. And so, you know, hopefully this can be like maybe like a, a biannual thing where I come in and just talk a little bit about asthma and COPD as well. I'm hoping this isn't the first and only time that I do this. I'd love to continue to reach out to everybody. Oh, I, I, I doubt it will be. I mean, when, <laughs> when we're in full swing, which who knows when that will happen again. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we always have, you know, Ruth is always having health and wellness programming and she'll focus on chronic diseases. You know, she'll have a focus for the month mm -hmm. and things like that. So I, I guarantee you, um, you will have other opportunities. Yeah. I can also talk about, uh, I mean, oh man, I mean, I'm a respiratory nerd, so I can talk about COPD. I can talk about pulmonary rehab. We can talk about nutrition and breathing. Like we can go down the rabbit hole if you need me to. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. So, I got a few more minutes. Um,
Okay, I just Googled. If we want to, if it kicks us out, just wait one minute and click on the same exact link. It'll take us right back to the same meeting. Okay, so we might need to announce that at the yeah. start <laughs> in case that happens. So everybody can do that. Thank you, Google. Okay, good to know. Yes, Google. Go, Google. Like, that's great to know. I didn't I didn't know that. I always ask just random questions on Google and it helps a lot. Can you hear the chainsaws that are in the background in my nope. universe? Oh good. Neighbors on both sides of me are having trees taken down today. So it's gonna be fun. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, you might hear random kitty cat meowing from the front door, like the door to my office. <laughs> um, I'm very familiar with that phenomenon. <laughs> Also the phenomenon of cats jumping on you mm -hmm. during um, Zooms. That's- I closed and walking, the door, so. walking by. Yeah. I kicked, I kicked my husband out of here. He, he's been working from home since last year. And I was like, I'm stealing your office for an hour. <laughs> so he's downstairs with a tray on his computer right now. <laughs> Familiar with that phenomenon as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a um, presentation I'm doing on Friday that I will lock the cats out of. Mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't, wouldn't be so cute and, you know in some settings it's fine to let them walk by and climb on me but that will not be one of them so <clears throat> All right, it is 10 a.m. Do you want to wait just a couple more minutes? Um, that's up to you. Yeah, would you like to wait just a couple more we could probably i guess just start introductions and stuff um and explain the the time limit if we need to absolutely you want me to go on ahead and, and do that sure let's get started all right well, we're gonna go ahead and get started folks i'm melanie lockman and i am the upside program coordinator at the tallahassee senior center and i'm standing in for Ruth Nickens, who's normally the, the host and introducer for such events. So thanks for, for having me. And so I want to introduce Allison Peters, who is our speaker for today. She'll be talking to y'all about COPD. And so forgive me a moment while I read you a few lovely words about Allison. So Allison Peters is a registered respiratory therapist and the chronic lung disease navigator at Tallahassee Memorial Hospital. She has been a respiratory therapist for almost seven years. A Tallahassee native, Allison received her respiratory degree from Tallahassee Community College. After graduation, she traveled to Gainesville and spent the first three years of her career at UF, UF Health Shands Hospital. She decided to come back home and has been employed as a respiratory therapist at TMH since 2018. She was promoted to her exciting new role as chronic lung disease navigator in October of 2019 
and has since been building an educational program to bring information to patients with diseases such as COPD, asthma, and other chronic respiratory conditions. Allison has also spent time at the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic, taking a break from the chronic lung disease program to assist patients and work alongside her fellow respiratory therapists, RNs, and doctors. Allison loves being a respiratory therapist and takes pride in helping others breathe a little better every day. Yay. So, yay. So thank you and welcome, Allison, and take it away. And before we do that, we were just discussing, I think Barbara has been listening, um, but Jill, this is a, a, a free Zoom account we're working with and it may boot us off after 40 minutes. However, Allison has discovered that if that happens, we wait one minute, then use the same link to click back in and rejoin. So hopefully that won't happen. I apologize, that is totally my it. fault. <laughs> this is my first uh, time hosting a Zoom meeting. So it's kind of with some, a little bit of struggles here and there, but just learn and move forward. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Once again, my name is Allison Peters and I am a registered respiratory therapist at Tallahassee Memorial Hospital. Um, I've been working really, really for a long time on um, past couple of years on building this program and really what it, it's, it's been a while. It's been like kind of like my baby as far as trying to help prevent readmissions in the hospital. Um, and the number one thing that kind of really helps patients stay out of the hospital is um, education. A lot of patients are getting thrown diagnoses and never really explained why and how to navigate through it. So that's kind of where I step in is like I come in and I educate doctors and physicians and I educate the bedside nurses and I educate the patients to prevent that from happening. Um, so I have prepared a PowerPoint for everybody. Um, st ugh, stick with me. All right. All right, is everybody able to see this? Yes, it's perfect, Allison. Yay, thank you. Okay, so basically COPD awareness. Um, I put in a couple of quotes that really mean a lot to me. Um, the ability to breathe is a gift. Wake up, wake up each day grateful for that gift. I think a lot of patients take for granted breathing until you can't do it anymore. And so we need to kind of step in and let them know that you know, this is a disease that a lot of Americans live with, but it's also something that you can prevent from getting worse and, you know, treat your breath like it's a gift. I think we really take breathing for granted until you, like I said, you can't do it anymore. Um, like I said, a little bit of background about me. I'm born and raised here in Tallahassee, and I've been a therapist for about seven years. I have a lot of uh, fun certifications. I uh, BLS, ACLS, PALS, and NRP certified, which means that I can work with adults all the way up to preme premature babies. Um, I worked at Shands for about three years, and I worked specifically in critical care, so I had a, a lot of knowledge and information on the the fun machines that we use to keep patients alive. Um, I've been at TMH for about three years and then promoted to the chronic lung disease position in 2019. Um, a lot of times people don't really understand what a respiratory therapist is. We get um, confused with as nurses for a lot of times and I don't mind, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, but I really do like to kind of point out that we are a lot different. We are specialized in the care of, of respiratory diseases and respiratory ailments, you know, so we, we are the ones called for any type of breathing problems. We are there for any cardiac arrests. Um, we are there for asthmatic, COPD. Um, anytime somebody needs to be put on a ventilator or BiPAP machine, um, we are a specialized healthcare practitioner and we're trained specifically in pulmonary medicine. Um, it's a minimum associate's degree and we are board, board certified and licensed healthcare practitioners. Um, you will find respiratory therapists everywhere. Um, we work in, you know, regular hospital floors and ICUs, pediatric ICUs, neonatal ICUs, um, emergency rooms, and then all the way outside of acute care hospitals, you know, uh, LTACs and skilled nursing facilities, rehabilitation centers. Um, if you've ever had a polysomnography or a sleep study, a lot of times your sleep professional is a respiratory therapist. Um, we also do a lot of home health care for patients that use oxygen and home ventilators. 
and then pulmonary function testing, which I will talk about later. Um, we do a lot. We, you know, we deliver oxygen therapy through many different delivery devices. Um, we deliver medications. We perform chest physiotherapy, lung expansion therapy. Um, you know, we assess, monitor, and maintain the ventilators and the BiPAPs and C flaps, and that HHNC is a high flow nasal cannula. We have a lot of different devices that we are trained on. I think at TMH we have two different types of ventilators, three different types, four different types, if you include the ones that we put on our cardiac patients. Um, and then CPAPs and BiPAPs, there's so many. We transport these critical patients. Um, you know, we, we obtain blood samples from arteries as opposed to veins. Uh, we perform diagnostic testing, uh, which is the sleep study and the pulmonary function testing, um, peak flow measurements for patients with asthma. And that's just a really basic of what all we can do and we, that we do do. So COPD, what does COPD stand for? It stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, it's a chronic progressive inflammatory disease that causes obstructive airflow from the lungs. And other terms for COPD include chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Um, a lot of times I'll go see a patient and they're saying, oh, I don't have COPD, I have bronchitis, chronic bronchitis. And I'm like, well, it's the same thing. It's part of COPD. And I think a lot of patients don't really understand that, that it's COPD is a, an umbrella term. There's different terms underneath it that we use. Um, COPD comes in four different stages. Um, stage one is mild, stage two is moderate, stage three is severe, and stage four is very severe. Um, statistics. 13 million people were diagnosed with COPD last year, and it's the fourth leading cause of death in the United States with 120,000 deaths per year. Um, COPD can be managed and disease progression can be slowed by smoke and cessation, proper education, proper medication regimen and usage, proper nutrition and other resources. And that's where my job comes in. Um, my job is to kind of provide a patient or a practitioner or a nurse with some of these tools so a patient can help manage their disease and prevent it from getting worse. Um, how does COPD affect breathing? Well, we have our normal healthy airways and lung tissue. And basically I'm gonna say we have the lung tissue and then we have the branches. So your bronchial tubes and then the lung tissue itself, which is this little great cluster called alveoli. Those are the little air sacs that your lungs um, use to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. And whenever they're healthy, they look beautiful. Looks like a little grape cluster. Your airways are nice and open and air can get through it. When we talk about a disease condition called chronic bronchitis, what chronic bronchitis does is it helps, it has chronic inflammation in the airways. Um, your airways become really swollen and it increases mucus production. You have wheezing because of the airways being so tightened and you have chest pressure and tightness. You have a chronic cough and you have frequent respiratory infections and also sometimes blue skin, which is what we call cyanosis. There on the left side is what we as respiratory therapists call a blue bloater. Emphysema actually damages those little grape cluster air sacs that we were talking about. So normal alveoli look like a grape cluster. Whenever you talk about emphysema, the alveoli, those little airways or those little grapes turn into one big grape. Um, and that decreases the surface area for oxygen and carbon dioxide transport to take place. Uh, emphysema symptoms can include fatigue, you know, chronic shortness of breath, weight loss, uh, difficulty sleeping wheezing, barrel chest, and then pink skin. So a lot of times as a respiratory therapist, you'll hear us refer to an emphysema patient as a pink puffer. Now with COPD, you can have emphysema or chronic bronchitis, or you can have both. Causes and risk factors of COPD. Uh, the number one cause of COPD is smoking cigarettes, and that's cigarettes, pipes, marijuana, and vape pens. We are starting to see a lot more of vape-related injury and vape-associated lung disease, and it actually kind of is speeding up the process. Um, cigarette smoke can take a long time over a long period of years. Vapes are kind of shortening that, so it's been a kind of a new horizon that I've been going through, uh, getting some knowledge on, on vape-related injury. Um, COPD can also be exposed or be caused by environmental exposures, you know, such as, uh, I can't see that part, um, second hand, third hand smoke, um, unsafe working conditions, um, environment, you know, 
when you work, if you work in like um, construction and you don't wear a mask all day and you've been doing it for 30 years, you might've never smoked, but that can definitely affect your lungs. Um, and that's the occupational exposure. And then there's also one um, type of genetic COPD, which is alpha-1 antitrypsin disorder. COPD is diagnosed using spirometry. Um, basically, it's the measurement of lung volumes and movement in air in and out of your lungs. Um, I call it pulmonary function testing, and then you'll hear people refer to it as PFTs. Um, this, this test can tell you the stage of your COP the C stage of your COPD and the type of COPD, um, and it is required to formally diagnose COPD. A lot of physicians will say, well, you smoke cigarettes for 30 years, you have COPD. That is a very safe assumption. However, it is um, a standard of practice to get a pulmonary function test. That way we can formally diagnose it. We know what we're working with and we know how to better treat it. Um, a lot of primary cares will kind of skip over the PFT and start prescribing medications and it's up to them, they're the physician. However, if it were me, I would wanna know exactly what stage and type of COPD I'm dealing with. Um, how COPD is treated and managed. Um, the number one most important step is to quit smoking cigarettes, quit smoking vape pens, quit smoking anything. If I have a smoker, there are so many resources for patients to quit smoking. Um, we have Tobacco Free Florida, you know, for my South Georgia patients, because we're so close, we have the G Georgia Department of Health, uh, smokefree.gov, and then the CDC um, has a how to quit website as well. Um, all of these, I will share all of these. Um, so if anybody needs to refer back to these, they can see these. Um, Tobacco Free Florida specifically offers a program through Big Ben AHEC, where they provide free nicotine replacement therapy. Um, if you do either online or group counseling, I don't think they're doing group counseling right now, but you could do Zoom meetings and they could provide you with those types of therapies. One thing I didn't include in this um, slideshow is that some patients with chronic heart conditions, their patient, their physicians do not want them on nicotine replacement therapy. And in that case, you would just talk to your primary care about either something like Shantix or Wellbutrin, you know, maybe an oral type of medication to help you quit. Um, but anyways, just the most important thing, just quit smoking. Um, education, what I was talking about earlier is the most important Number one step besides quitting smoking and managing a disease like COPD is you want to, it's a progressive disease. You want to keep it from getting worse. And so educate yourself on the disease that you have, you know, go get that pulmonary function test, know exactly what stage COPD you have, um, know how to manage it, know, just knowing all those things can make a world of difference. Um, I have a few of my favorite websites that I think educate and explain COPD the best, which is the COPD Foundation, uh, the American Lung Association, the American Thoracic Society, and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Um, those websites are wonderful. They're really easy to navigate, and they can break things down even further if you feel like you need more information that I'm not providing for you. So this is one of the most recent posters from the Allergy and Asthma Network. And this is just to show you the different types of inhalers that are out on the market right now that are used to treat COPD and asthma. So a lot of times I'll be talking to patients and I'll say, what inhalers are you taking? And they're like, well, I don't know, the purple one. Well, that's, we have like four different purple ones on here. So that's why it's also important to be educated. It's, it's important to know exactly what medications you're taking, why you're taking them, and then the different types of medications. Um, inhaled medications include bronchodilators, and those are inhaled medications that help relax the smooth muscle and tissue in your lungs. Um, there are two types of bronchodilators. There are short acting, and these are known as rescue drugs. Um, if you've ever had kids with asthma, there's something called albuterol. Um, it's one of the most common bronchodilators on the market. It's very short acting. Um, it works really quickly, but it doesn't last for very long. And that's whenever with patients with really bad COPD, um, we put them on something called a long acting bronchodilator. And these are our maintenance drugs. Um, it's similar to taking like a blood pressure medicine every day to prevent your blood pressure from getting bad. These are inhalers that you use to take that you'll take once or twice a day and it'll help prevent your flare ups from happening. 
Um, we also use something called corticosteroids and that helps for, that's an inhaled um, steroid that helps reduce inflammation in the lungs. Uh, corticosteroids are always long acting and they work over a period of time to prevent flare ups. Um, Bronchodilators and corticosteroids can be alone or combined to treat and prevent COPD flare ups. And you always should consult your physician about the appropriate medic medication regimen um, to manage your COPD. It's very important to follow your prescribed med medication regimen exactly how you do it. Um, I do have some patients that are like, well, I'm supposed to use it twice a day, but I only use it once a day. But that's not how it's prescribed. It's very important to follow how it's prescribed and take it how it is ordered from your physician. Um, and also, if you ever have any questions and you're just confused, just um, hold on just a second. Oh, the, the Zoom actually just gave me a notification saying that they've removed the 40 minute time limit for my group meeting. So hopefully it won't shut off for us now. Yay. <laughs> um, always contact your uh, physician and, pulmon and or pulmonologist if you have any question about your medications, uh, your regimen or how you should take it. Um, this is something that I really like. I tell people to be kind of a squeaky wheel. You know, squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, a lot of times, patients get prescribed inhalers and they don't know how to use it or they are confused about when they're supposed to take it, don't be afraid to ask questions and don't be afraid to call the office back. And if they don't call you back, call them back again the next day. Um, oh no, there we go. Uh, types of inhaled medication. So this is where things kind of get a little squirrely. Um, we have all different kinds of ways that we deliver inhaled medications. Um, sometimes we have one medication that can be delivered like three different ways. And this is where, you know, where I kind of harp on ask questions if you don't understand. Um, a nebulizer is a device um, for breathing treatments to help patients breathe, brother, breathe better. It uh, changes liquid medicine into a fine mist and the mist goes in your airways and lungs and you breathe it in over a period of time. Um, we have a metered dose inhaler, which is called an MDI. It's a device that lets you, um, that delivers a measured amount of fine mist medication, and it's in, delivered by an inhaled propellant. Um, and then we have a dry powder inhaler, which it delivers um, a dose of dry powder that you breathe in, and you must be able to take a really big deep breath in to get this medication into your lungs where it belongs. Um, we also have a fairly new type of inhaler that just came out on the market called a Respiromat, and it's a soft mist inhaler. It, it's fairly new, kind of expensive, and there's only probably about three or four medications that are delivered via Respiromat. Um, prescription assistance is also a kind of a big thing. Inhalers are actually very, very, very expensive, and even whenever your insurance costs, costs, covers most of the costs, sometimes those... Um, Copays can really get you, and I find a lot of patients end up falling in the donut hole towards the end of the end of the year, and it becomes a thing. So I always point them towards uh, websites like GoodRx because um, they have coupons, and then you can always try and you know kind of shop around for the best prescription prices. Um, it's also good to consult the drug manufacturer of the inhaler that you're prescribed, such as AstraZeneca. Uh, GSK or other medication providers, if you go to their websites, um, most of them always have a prescription assistance program. A lot of times the pulmonologist or primary care might know about this too and might even be able to help you um, do that. There's also some loopholes with Medicare and I don't really want to speak too much on it because I'm still learning, um, but always talk to your doctor about it too. Sometimes it's kind of a trial and error. I get prescribed this and I don't get covered. We'll call your doctor the next day and say, I'm not covered on this medication. And then, you know, okay, let's try another one and just kind of see what works best for you. Um, oxygen is another thing that we use to treat patients with COPD. Um, oxygen is a drug and it requires uh, testing to qualify for, and you need a prescription from your physician. Oxygen, um, not everybody with COPD will require oxygen. And there's different home devices that you can use. Um, we have oxygen concentrators, we have tanks, we have breath actuated cannulas, um, and then we have actually home ventilators, BiPAPs and CPAPs with oxygen delivered. Um, depending, on, depending on the severity of your disease, you know, like I said, you may or may not need oxygen, but if you feel like that's coming to a point where, you're, where you might need it, it does require testing and you do have to qualify for it. 
Um, COPD is also treated and managed by something called pulmonary rehabilitation. Um, once you start having COPD flare-ups, it is super duper duper important to stay active and to kind of try and build back any strength that is lost. Um, and that's where pulmonary rehab, I always explain to patients that pulmonary rehab is the gym with oxygen. Um, it's a wonderful program. TMH actually has a pulmonary rehab facility at the bottom of the uh, SMG building, the Southern Medical Group building. It's a great program and it's always something you can talk to your physician about as well. Uh, proper nutrition is really important basically just eat good. Um, a lot of times with COPD, your body works so hard just to be able to breathe properly that you actually burn through calories a lot faster than a normal person would. So it's important to eat a proper nutrition, a proper balanced diet of, you know, good protein, vegetables, and not high carbohydrates or sugar or something that your body will have to work hard, not only breathing, but digesting that type of food as well. And then there's different surgeries. Once again, talk to your physician about the best treatment plan. Um, I like to kind of get into COPD exacerbation. So a COPD exacerbation is basically a flare up of your disease where your respi respiratory symptoms become more severe. Um, exacerbations can last for a few days um, to a few weeks. It can require antibiotics, the oral corticosteroids, and even hospitalizations. Um, COPD exacerbations can leave behind permanent and irreversible lung damage and they can increase in frequency and severity if they're not properly managed. Um, I've had many times where patients have told me that they are fine, they were fine, I've been totally fine up until this happened, and then ever since this one flare up happened and I went to the hospital, I've been in the hospital once a month since then. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons for that, but that first exacerbation makes the second one twice as likely and it, and it causes irreversible lung damage. And that's where pulmonary rehab also comes in. Once that first exacerbation happens, you wanna make sure that you're properly managing and that you are taking very well care of yourself after that to prevent the next one from happening. Um, COPD exacerbations can also be caused or triggered by certain things. Um, weather is a big thing. We live in the most wonderful part of Florida where we have all four seasons in a week. Um, it can either be too hot or too cold. It can be humid. It can, we can have pollen and seasonal changes. Um, any type of cigarette smoke, even if you have COPD and you quit smoking, if you live with a smoker, that cigarette smoke can trigger an exacerbation. Um, pet dander, and then viral or bacterial infections, such as a cold or a flu. And so it's super duper important to get your pneumonia and flu shots every year to prevent those from happening. Um, you can have household dust and mold. You know, a lot of times as your disease progresses, you don't have a chance to clean your house as effectively as you would like to. But it's actually really important that you do because once that dirt and dander builds up, it can actually be a trigger. And then fumes from household cleaners, paint, um, even cooking. You know, a lot of times some of those things, if your airway is pretty sensitive, hypersensitive as I would say, um, some of those things can really, really affect your breathing and kind of push you over the edge. Um, this is something I really like to harp on as well. There are warning signs and symptoms to a pending flare up or an exacerbation. And a lot of times with chronic lung diseases, you kind of look at, is it, a, is it a bad day? And a lot of patients are like, oh, I'm okay. It's just a bad day. Let's wait till tomorrow. Let's wait till the next day. I like to kind of point these out to patients because there are different signs that can kind of point out that something's fixing to happen. Um, there's increasing shortness of breath despite proper use of your inhaled medications and even at rest, uh, increased wheezing and chest tightness, increased coughing and mucus production, and with that mucus production, a change in color, you know, you could start coughing up clear, fine, and then the next day it's starting to turn a little yellow. That's a warning sign. Um, increased fatigue where you're sleeping a lot. Um, you don't feel like getting up out of bed. It, it's taking a lot for you to even walk to the kitchen to get something to drink. Uh, loss of appetite. Sometimes there's stomach aches. I mean, there's plenty of other symptoms. Symptoms can be gradual or acute, but always uh, monitor your symptoms and report warning signs to your physicians. Once again, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. I tell people, tell everybody, when you don't feel good, you tell everybody. Um, and this is something called an action plan. Uh, I use this a lot whenever it comes to teaching with my patients. It kind of helps you differentiate between 
normal symptoms and when you need to get, when you need to seek help. Um, a lot of times my patients are like, well, I don't know. I don't want to be a burden to my doctor. I don't want to make a big deal about something that's not a big deal. Me as a healthcare pr practitioner, I would rather you come get checked out or go to the doctor and then to tell you it's nothing than you to ignore it and then it become a bigger problem. So don't ever think that you're becoming a burden to us because it's my job to make sure that you don't have a flare up so bad that you're in the hospital. Um, green zone is good. You're living your best life. Uh, you do your normal um, activity and exercise level. You, you know, have some patients have a chronic cough. And so if it's a normal cough, it's normal phlegm, that's okay. Um, you're sleeping okay at night and your appetite is good. And so the actions that you'll take is you'll take your medicines as prescribed. You know, you'll use your oxygen if you need to as prescribed. You'll continue with your regular diet and exercise plan. And at all times you'll, you'll avoid the cigarette smoke or those known triggers that can push you over the edge. Now the yellow zone is the one that I think is the most important because, because these are those warning signs that I was talking about. Um, so with COPD, you are allowed to have a bad day. You know, your breathing will wax and wane. You'll have good days and then you'll have bad days. But I always tell patients your bad days should never last longer than 12 to 24 hours. And that's kind of a, a staple that I sit there and say 12 to 24 hours. If it lasts longer than that, then something needs to be done. But uh, a kind of a bad day with COPD is that you're more breathless than you usually are despite using your medications. Um, you don't have any energy for your daily activities. And when I say daily activities, I mean like doing the dishes, taking a shower, doing things that you normally do. If you're starting to get less energy and breathless doing those things, that's a warning sign. Um, you have increased um, phlegm or mucus. It's becoming thicker and it's starting to change color. That's a warning sign. Um, if you're using that rescue inhaler that I was talking about earlier, most of the time you can use that up to four hours uh, up to every four hours at home. But if you're starting to use it every four hours with no relief or even more often, you know, that's a warning sign. Um, you're coughing more than you usually do. Your ankles are swelling. Um, you're not having a good time sleeping. Some patients tell me that they sleep, and they get to the point where they have to start putting pillows behind them or sit up in an armchair to sleep. You know, that's a warning sign telling you something's wrong. And then once again, you know, your medicine's not working and you're not, your, your appetite's not good. Those are all warning signs. So what we're going to do with our actions is we're going to continue our daily medications. Um, you're going to use your quick relief inhaler. You can use it up to every four hours. Um, the prednisone and antibiotic is something that you need to discuss with your physician. And this is where I'm going to say, call your doctor. Um, 12 to 24 hours and you're still not feeling good after you're taking all your medicines like you're supposed to, including that quick relief, then I would call my doctor. A lot of times just that phone call to the physician or a stop by their office, they can get you on a prednisone, an oral, an oral steroid, or they can get you on an antibiotic and get ahead of what's fixing to happen and then you will not end up in the hospital. Um, you're going to use your oxygen as prescribed. You know, you're going to use breathing exercises like purse breathing. You're going to take it easy. Um, and then you're going to also still avoid those triggers and, you know, call a provider if your symptoms don't improve. If you do get prescribed your prednisone and your antibiotic and you take it a day or two and you're still not feeling good, you know, you're, like I said, squeaky wheel, call somebody and tell them. Now the red zone is the bad zone. Um, and it's where you basically, these are where you just need to call 911 or you need to go to the ER. And it's the severe shortness of breath, even at rest. If you're sitting still and you haven't done anything and you're having a hard time breathing, don't even play around. Go to the doctor, um, go to the hospital, go see, go, go do something. <laughs> um, not able to do any activity because of your breathing. If you're not able to sleep because you can't breathe. Um, if you have a fever and you're shaking and you have chills. If you start feeling confused or incredibly drowsy despite sleeping. If you're having chest pain or if you're coughing up blood, those are all, those are all emergency symptoms. And that's when you would need to call 911 or go to the emergency room. Um, here's some of my information. Um, I, that is my office phone number and my email. If for any reason after this presentation and questions, if you find you have more questions and you wanna ask me anything, please feel free to contact, my, contact me by email. I will not be at this phone number until next week. Um, and then also the Tallahassee Pulmonary Clinic. Um, it is an affiliate of Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare. We have about, if I'm correct, about 12 or 13 wonderful pulmonologists. 
I feel like anybody with a chronic lung disease should be managed by a pulmonologist, but I could be biased because I'm a respiratory therapist. Um, the pulmonary clinic is wonderful. The only way that is their phone number. And then if, uh, if you ever wanted to connect with them, you could just ask your primary care to send over your information and they'll get you a, um, an appointment set up. And then uh, once again, another quote, just to kind of end on a good note is uh, for breath is life. And if you breathe well, you will live long. I can't even remember what the end of it was. <laughs> it's kind of blocking me. So is, are there any questions from anybody? There is one in the chat. Oh, hey. And it is, how is asthma related to COPD? Can asthma lead to COPD in a non-smoker? Um, so I feel like asthma is something that you could be born with. You can develop it as you get older. Um, it is also a chronic inflammatory disease. Sometimes it, there's a bunch of different, I'm hoping to do an asthma one eventually. Um, you know, I feel like, I feel like asthma, a lot of times whenever a patient has asthma and they, they grow as they get older, um, it is treated as an asthma COPD overlap because having chronic asthma for a long time, for a, a long time can lead to tissue damage in your lungs. And then we're dealing with a COPD type of, you know, lung disease. So a lot of times doctors, uh, older patients, probably in their 60s, 70s, and 80s that have asthma are ultimately prescribed medications and they are treated as a COPD asthma overlap. Um, when you are younger and you develop asthma, um, a lot of things can trigger asthma that's a little bit different. Sometimes asthma can be more of an allergic reaction and an, an inflammation caused by allergies. Um, you know, COPD, allergies would be a trigger for COPD, but not necessarily a cause. Um, I would love to do, hopefully, hold with bated breath. I'll do an asthma presentation for you guys too. Um, I feel like asthma is more inflammatory. I kind of equate asthma to chronic bronchitis. You know, that tissue damage is not necessarily there, but that inflammation, um, the respiratory infections, um, you know, excess secretions and stuff. Um, a lot of times those types of patients need to be put on chronic oral steroids, chronic inhaled steroids, because that's the way to get that inflammation under control. Um, I'm still in the process of learning a lot about um, asthma in adults. So I'm hoping to gather more information about that. Oh, wonderful. I hope that answered your question. Feel free to ask follow-ups. And I think at this point, you can certainly unmute yourself. If you have a, a question, you don't necessarily have to go through the chat. And if we don't have any questions, I was gonna actually do some inhaler techniques if anybody would like to see them. So what I was talking about earlier is um, a lot of times patients get prescribed inhalers and they're like, here's an inhaler, have a good day. Here's how, to, but you know, there are certain ways to use your inhalers properly that actually make a huge difference in the amount of medication that actually gets into your lungs. Um, what I was speaking on earlier, now nebulizers are pretty simple. Um, you, they're kind of put the medication in, you breathe over it a long time in and out through your mouth, you're good to go. Inhalers such as this one right here, this is that metered dose inhaler that I was talking about. So these types of inhalers have a propellant in them and there's a specific way that it needs to be used in order to get the best bang for your buck. Um, these medications are used with a propellant. So when you squeeze it, and this one's fake, so there's no medicine, but we're gonna assume that when you squeeze it, medicine shoots out the end. A lot of times patients are taught, you know, shake it up, put it in your mouth, squeeze and take a big deep breath in as you squeeze in. Well, what happens if I have arthritis in my hands or what happens if I squeeze and I don't take the breath in at the exact time that I, that I squeeze and then I get a lot of that medicine in my mouth. Um, so what we kind of like to ask patients to use and sometimes pulmonologists will say is this thing right here and this is called a spacer, a spacer or an arrow chamber. This helps you get more medication dispersion in your lungs. Whenever I shake this up and squeeze it and take a big deep breath in, a lot of times that medicine shoots into the back of my throat and I only get about 40 to 50% medicine in my lungs. Whenever I put this in here, you'll shake it up like you normally do. 
this has a little valve right here on the end near the mouthpiece. So whenever I go to squeeze the medicine, it'll stay within this chamber until I put it in my mouth and take a big deep breath in. So we'll go through the motions. Um, I got my medicine. It's time for me to take my medicine in the morning. This is my maintenance inhaler. I'm gonna shake it up and get ready. I'll stick it right here. I don't even have to have it in my mouth. So I'll do my first puff, put it in my mouth and take a big deep breath in. Now, when you take that deep breath in, I also ask patients to hold their breath for about 10 or 15 seconds. A lot of patients will squeeze and go, well, once you exhale, you're blowing all that medicine back out. So if you can focus on holding your breath for about 10 to 15 seconds, you're given that medicine that you just inhaled down into your lungs a chance to settle into the tissues where it needs to be. And then you'll get a lot more medication dispersion in your lungs. When you use an aero chamber or a spacer like this, you get 30% more of your effective medication down to where it needs to go. Um, I always say, most of the time your, your doses are two puffs, take about 30 to 45 seconds between puffs as well. You wanna let that first dose get down in there and settle in, and then you'll take this and do your second dose. Most um, aero chambers work with any type of inhaler that looks like this. So not necessarily a red one, but a neater dose inhaler. So you can use it with your Simbacor, you can use it with your Albuterol, you can use it with um, I'm trying to think of any other like metered dose inhaler medications, any medication that looks like this. Um, you can get an aero chamber or a spacer off of um, Amazon. I think they're like 15 or 20 bucks on Amazon. Um, any patient that comes into the hospital and has an, a, a metered dose inhaler prescribed um, at TMH, it's part of our practice to at least offer them the option of an aero chamber. Um, anytime I go see patients, I push the aero chamber. And then I also tell people too, if you really want to be a little bit of a MacGyver and you don't want to buy one, you can kind of fashion like um, a toilet paper roll a little bit, just any way to kind of offer a little bit of space between you and the inhaler to where you can kind of inhale it into your lungs. Um, I've seen patients and I've heard about the toilet paper roll uh, technique. Um, another thing I want to talk about is powder inhalers. Now, Powder inhalers, such as this one right here, this is like the Ellipta group. These are kind of not fairly new, but they're very popular in the market right now. So we have Brio, Anoro, uh, Trilogy. These are all what we call DPIs, they're dry powder inhalers. Um, I like to let people know that in order for this to get down into the lung fields where it needs to be is that you have to be able to take a really big deep breath in. You know, some patients will open this and go, and I'm like, no, no, no. It needs to be hard and fast and as hard, as deep as you can. I tell patients to always, you know, sit on the edge of your bed with your feet planted on the ground. Don't do it while you're standing up because if you get dizzy from taking that deep breath, we don't want to have a fall on our hands. I always say, you know, just kind of hold the bottom, let all the air out of your lungs and then take a huge deep breath in. Once again, you're going to want to do that breath hold. You want to hold your breath for about 10 to 15 seconds if you can. And then I kind of, I call it almost like a, a tipping a glass up. Um, I feel like that's a pretty good technique because you're kind of opening your airway, not all the way up, but you want to start kind of in the middle and open your airway using gravity and that forceful inhalation to bring that, bring that medicine down into where you need to go. This is that wonderful new Resper mat that I was talking about. It's a fine mist. There's really no, this one's pretty, pretty easy and it's a pretty wonderful device. They can get a little expensive. Um, basically, it's where you twist and it has a little actuation button right here. And if you push, it has a little mist that comes out. Um, the particle size or the, the size of the mist that comes out of this is very fine and it works, it actually works really well when you take a nice deep breath in. So it doesn't have the forceful propellant that an MDI has, but you also don't have to take a huge deep breath as a powder. Um, I do have a lot of patients with really bad COPD that don't prefer the powder. So if that's ever a, a thing as well, you can talk to your physician and say, the powder's not for me, it irritates my airway. And sometimes you can find the same types or even the same exact medication just delivered differently. Uh, delivery devices matter. 
Um, one more thing I kind of wanted to point out, I have a bunch of really fake inhalers, is this thing right here is a, another powder inhaler that you might see, which actually comes in the form of a pill. So you'll have like a little pill packet that comes with this inhaler that you'll put in here and you'll push this right here and then big deep breath in, also a powder inhaler. Um, I like to show, like I said, techniques on doing those inhalers because some of those little tweaks make a huge difference too. Um, any questions about anything else? I guess not. Well, I wanted to thank everybody for coming out and taking a listen to my presentation. Um, I will be forwarding, I'm recording this, and I'm also going to forward that PowerPoint over to the Senior Center. So if anybody ever needed to refer back to those slides with the information on it, um, once again, you feel free to email me if you ever have any questions about anything. Um, my program is ever changing and ever evolving. I'm very excited to, I'm not excited to leave bedside because I love bedside, but I'm excited to get back into it and I'm always trying, I'm always asking for feedback if anybody has any, you know, suggestions, you know, it's always what's best for the patient. I always, I always really enjoy what I do and tweaking it along the way. So, and then I look forward to hopefully putting together a, a better answer to that asthma question and more information regarding that, especially with adults, because I feel like adults with asthma are, are overlooked a lot. Well, that was wonderful. Allison, thank you so very much. Thank you guys. Um, I really appreciate it and I hope to see you guys soon. Thank you. Okay. Melanie, I will send this video and the PowerPoint to Ruth because I have her email. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Thank you That's so much. Great. That was really wonderful. Awesome. Was... Thank you guys. Have a great day. Learned a lot. Thank you.